All right, so let's talk a little bit about preventing and treatment uh, for cardiovascular disease. So let's kind of talk about first the difference between non-modifiable and modifiable risk factors. So your non-modifiable cardiac risk factors are going to be age, gender, ethnicity, and genetics. And depending on what type of cardiovascular disease you're talking about, um, it's going to depend on exactly where it is. But generally, most people are going to be more at risk for cardiovascular disease as they get older. Um, men in their 40s and 50s are usually more at risk versus um, once we hit 70, women live longer, so um, usually women are more at risk as they get older. Um, gender, most of the time men, especially like I mentioned when they're younger, are going to be uh, more at risk versus uh, women as we, again, because we live longer as we get older. Um, ethnicity, it depends on the disease process, like for hypertension, hypertension is more common in African American population, especially at a younger age, um, whereas, you know, other things like coronary artery disease is more common in white males. Um, so that's just going to vary on the disease process, and then there's also genetics, so um, family history, things like that can uh, predispose a person to uh, be at higher risk for cardiovascular disease. So now let's look at modifiable. So the la things on the last slide we could not change. Let's look at the things we can change and what we can maybe tell this patient, teach them, help them to optimize their health. Because if you think about cardiovascular disease, all of it is intertwined. One thing affects the other, which affects the other. Um, and so it's really helpful to tell them as a whole how to manage their health on multiple spectrums to prevent their, um, you know, decrease their modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So our first one is what we can change is hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol. So how can I help a patient with this? Um, we can tell them to take their medication and that's going to be like your statins, your fibric acid derivatives. Um, those kind of medications that are going to help to lower your lipid levels. Um, we can tell them to make diet changes, you know, decreasing the fats in their diet, um, a more balanced diet, low sodium diet. Um, in general, just trying to um, decrease that fat accumulation that's happening in their blood vessels. Uh, we can also encourage exercise. Um, exercise has by itself, you know, uh, many studies have shown that um, exercise alone can help to decrease those uh, lipid levels for a patient. And then managing diabetes. There's a very close tie between insulin and, um, you know, uh, accumulation of cholesterol. So uh, making sure that the patient is keeping their blood sugar under control um, and managing their medications well. So another modifiable risk factor is going to be hypertension. So what can we tell a patient about hypertension? Well, we're going to first tell them you need to take your medications. A lot of people won't take their hypertension medications because they're like, oh, my blood pressure is fine. But the thing is their blood pressure is fine because they're taking their medications. Um, so we really want to encourage medication compliance. And this can be hard because people with hypertension usually don't have symptoms. So one, they don't even know that they have a problem. But even once they have know that they have the problem, they don't really have a lot of motivation to take their medication because they feel fine. They're not feeling those effects yet, but their body is feeling those effects. So teaching them the importance of medication compliance and making sure that they understand the side effects of their medication. Um, it's really important so that we can uh, kind of encourage them to make sure that they are staying compliant um, with all of their medications. Uh, we also want to encourage diet changes, so the low sodium diet, um, so they don't accumulate extra fluid, um, and also kind of keeping that lower fat diet, um, the general cardiovascular diet to help to uh, encourage them to have better health of their blood vessels. Um, exercise can help to decrease hypertension, and we're going to talk more about exercise and inactivity later, um, but encouraging them to um, get moving, start an exercise program, start a walking program can help to decrease their blood pressure. Uh, managing their diabetes is also very um, important uh, because, uh, like I mentioned before, uh, about that role of 
um, cholesterol and insulin, that's part of it. But also diabetes is really hard on the blood vessels. Um, diabetes and all that excess glucose that's in the blood, it really wears down and it literally um, can um, you know, cut into the lining, uh, the inner lining of the blood vessels and lead to those plaque formations or that clot formation um, from plaques, which can lead to cardiac events. Um, so making sure that people are keeping their glucose levels um, at a stable level is so important. Uh, stop smoking. So, you know, one of the best things that a person can do for their blood vessels is stop smoking. Smoking is such a potent vasoconstrictor and can cause hypertension to get so much worse. Um, and, you know, most studies show now that, you know, it's not kind of like diabetes, you know, where once you have diabetes, you know, that damage has already been happening for a while. And with smoking, once you stop smoking, like you can actually return a lot of the function of a lot of the problems that smoking causes back to normal um, within a few months of stopping smoking. So um, that's a very easily modifiable habit. When I say easy, I don't mean it's easy for the person. But what I mean is, is that it's a very, let me put it this way, it's very helpful to that person if they can stop smoking. Um, and then also just managing their life stressors. Um, stress has such a, an important role in hypertension. So helping them to reduce any work stress, family stress, maybe that means you know, going to counseling, support groups, things like that. Um, but, you know, kind of looking at their environment, their lifestyle, um, and seeing what might be contributing to their hypertension. Another thing we can change is a diabetes. Can we change that a person has diabetes? No, but we can change how it's managed. So we would tell them to keep their blood sugar in normal range. Um, that's about 70 to 100 is where we would like it to be. Um, but each person's going to be um, different just depending, of course, on what their doctor uh, wants them to be at. Um, diet and diabetes is so important because remember I said it's that excess glucose um, that's in the blood that accumulates because remember people with diabetes they don't have that key to get um, glucose into the cell the insulin is not um, working you know to open the cell to get glucose in um, or they have no insulin to get glucose into the cell so either way there's a ton of glucose um, out in the bloodstream and it's just breaking down the blood vessels and making it so much harder for them to function it's making them narrow it's making them um, uh, we call them very um, inflexible and so we really want to encourage this patient to try to um, do more of the lower carbohydrate diet um, and also a heart healthy diet as well. Um, this is why most diabetics are, um, even if they don't have cardiovascular disease, are put on a heart healthy diet to go ahead and start doing that protection because diabetes and heart disease are so closely linked. Um, regular exercise is so important in diabetes as well. Um, it's going to help them to lose weight, you know, increase their energy levels um, and improve their overall health. Um, and then regular health maintenance and routine monitoring. So making sure patients that have diabetes are getting their, um, you know, lipid levels checked on a regular basis, um, checking that heart function on a regular basis and being on the lookout. Um, people with diabetes can be at risk for a painless MI, which means they're having a heart attack and they can't even feel it. Um, they can be at risk for a lot of other cardiovascular diseases as well. And because of that lack of um, nerve sensation a lot of times you know they come kind of come up to them insidiously so this patient's at risk for a lot of complications from cardiovascular disease so making sure that they're regularly getting assessed and monitored for these diseases can help to um, prevent them from having a sudden cardiac event uh, so we also have smoking and so how can we change this the easy answer is stop smoking like I said it's not easy for people to do that um, there's medications that patients can take. There's patches, pills, and other things, uh, other options for patients. Um, and also lots of support groups. There are, um, you know, some actual, like, treatment programs to quit smoking where you can go to classes and things like that. Um, John Peter Smith Hospital um, offers some um, smoking cessation classes and counseling. Um, there's lots of support out there. Um, and a lot of the other things that we want to tell them is maybe, you know, um, the environment they're in. So if they're around um, situations, stressful situations that um, usually lead them to smoke that are modifiable, you know, trying to modify those things. Um, or if they are, um, you know, around a lot of other smokers in their envir environment, trying to, you know, avoid that secondhand smoke. Um, 
yeah, it can be really hard. A lot of people, they want to quit smoking, but they're just everything that's in their environment, everyone in their house smokes, things like that. And so sometimes it has to be kind of a team effort and um, getting, you know, the whole family involved in this. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, like I mentioned, one of the um, best things that a person can do to decrease their risk factors for cardiovascular disease. So another thing that we can change is sedentary lifestyle. So how can we encourage a patient to improve upon this? Well, telling them to get active. Um, we should encourage them to do activities that they actually enjoy because they're going to be more likely to do them if they actually enjoy them. Um, you know, there's tons of accountability groups available for patients if they're interested in, you know, trying um, to do something, but they feel like they need a little bit of support. Um, there's also a ton of apps that can be downloaded to, you know, uh, track exercise. You know, people are getting on Fitbit now and doing all of those um, challenges to kind of get them motivated. You can get on your Pokemon Go and get walking and catch some Pokemon. Um, you get the benefit of that, you know, you get rewards from walking. Um, there's a ton of things out there to kind of get you motivated. A lot of people want that competition or that other outside motivation to get them moving, whatever it takes. Uh, usually exercise, we say uh, like 30 minutes, at least three to five days a week. It depends on what kind of cardiovascular disease you have and any restrictions you might have. But usually preference is for five days a week, at least 30 minutes. And we say moderate int intensity exercise. That means that, you know, it's not an exercise where we could uh, be having a casual conversation during it. It would be a little bit difficult to breathe and talk at the same time if we were doing moderate intensity exercise. Um, adding strength training and flexibility is also another great um, option for these patients to help to increase that muscle strength, increase their blood flow, um, and also um, you know things like yoga and stuff like that can improve mood, decrease stress, and so many other things. Um, if they have you know chronic stable angina, they may need to take their nitro um, prior to their activity uh, to make sure that they're not um, going to have that. Uh, angina effect, you know, have that narrowing of their blood vessels as they're exercising, which is going to lead to that chest pain. So if they can take their medication before, it may lead to better results with the activity. And if they're diabetic, um, checking their blood glucose to make sure that they're safe to do activity prior to activity. Um, as a whole, you know, if they have any other disease processes, they should be checking with their doctor to see um, what exercise is safe, how much they should be doing, and um, you know, what, uh, fitness level that is safe for them, what activities may be safe for them, if they have any precautions. There's also obesity. So what can we do about obesity? So a lot of the things we said before, um, weight loss is so important in cardiovascular disease and even a modest or small weight loss can make a big difference. So, um, diet and exercise. So, um, increasing, um, the amount of activity the person's doing, starting a walking program, getting in those accountability groups, support groups like Overeaters Anonymous um, is another option. Um, diet, you know, kind of keeping that low fat, um, low carbohydrate, uh, excuse me, carbohydrates. Um, and, um, you know, if those things don't work, maybe working with a nutritionist if we're patients not really familiar with the uh, healthy foods to eat. Um, and, you know, the, some of the later options are usually, you know, weight loss medications or weight loss surgery if all else fails. Uh, we really want them, you know, we don't want them doing crash and fad diets. We really want them doing something that they can sustain, something that, that's going to work for them long term. Um, because uh, all those crash and fad diets, they may work for a short period of time, but if they don't work long term, um, they're not helping the patient. And um, that up and down of the weight can sometimes actually be worse for the body than um, that sustained increased weight. So um, making sure that we are... Um, you know, just kind of encouraging them to uh, make lifestyle changes and not just um, temporary changes to get the weight off. Last but not least, we want to consider our psychosocial uh, risk factors. And so what can we do about social psychosocial risk factors? Those would be like anxiety, depression, stress, all of those things. So uh, we would, uh, you know, encourage them to get counseling. Uh, if they need to, they may need to get some medication started. 
Um, there's a ton of support groups out there for a variety of conditions. So encouraging them to reach out and not isolate and get help. Um, cause usually pretty much if you have any problem today, there's a support group for it. Um, so helping to connect them with resources for them to find other people that are going through something similar that they're going through. Um, exercise helps to increase endorphins and helps to elevate mood and um, can make a big difference in a person's day-to-day -day life. So encouraging exercise, um, decreasing stress, kind of going back to, you know, thinking about how stress can cause you know, high blood pressure and other things. So um, modifying their environment, maybe looking at the situations that they're in, the things that they're experiencing and seeing if there's anything that can be modified. Um, and then also uh, meditation. So a lot of people are, um, you know, practicing mindfulness and meditation, living in the moment and have found a lot of success with that. So um, it's another option that you can share with them uh, that they can research on their own. There's apps to do meditation. Um, there's meditation retreats and lots of other resources and places that they can go to meditate. Um, so this sums up, yes, there's other risk factors and stuff for cardiovascular disease, but these are some of the big ones. Um, so hopefully this helped kind of break it down, you know, what you're going to talk about with the patient, uh, what you can help them do. There's lots of options. We just need to be supportive for them because um, like I mentioned, all these things are connected and um, they all build upon each other. So if we can start kind of getting at the bottom of each of them, we can help to um, increase the uh, person's satisfaction, uh, their quality of life, and decrease their risk for cardiac events. Thank you.